at least that. Welcome, welcome everybody. It's great to see a big crowd here. We'll have an interesting night to welcome to the February 13th uh, meeting of the city council and the public forum. And uh, we are going to begin this public forum with a presentation. Um, I want to welcome Candace Shorak, who is president of the Eugene Jinju Sister City Committee. And she is joined by Sukriti Agarwal, a junior at South Eugene High School, and Haley Smith, a junior at Willamette High School. And um, I believe Candace is representing Abby Reynolds. And they are here to introduce the Youth Ambassador Exchange Program and talk about their trip to Korea. So please. Thank you. Um, I'm the president of the Sister City Committee. And to everyone behind me, we are actively recruiting students for this coming summer. Uh, the mayor of Jinju loves our program. And in fact, he's putting the screws to us. He wants us to host 10 students. Six is where we've drawn the line so far. Um, so I'll go ahead and tell you about Abby's experience. You have to imagine a very tall high school girl. Uh, she is busy playing volleyball. Uh, but her story is that when she was in Korea, she kept a daily journal. I did not communicate with my family at all while I was overseas, either by email or on the phone, because I wanted to be totally immersed in the experience. When I look back at my journal now, I am struck by how detailed the entries are. We were constantly on the go in Korea, and I'm glad that I have a record of everything that happened. For example, one of the most memorable experiences I had in Korea was going to karaoke with everyone in the group. <laughs> Usually I'm nervous about singing, but when we sang together, everyone was supportive, and it is not as scary as when I first, as I thought it would be. In fact, it was really fun. Another memorable experience was when I tried snow ice for the first time. I've never tasted anything so delicious. I wanted to take a picture of the snow ice that we were sharing so I could show it to my family. But before I knew it, we had eaten it up. <laughs> a third mem memorable experience was eating on the river with the Korean students and their families. The tables were right on the river. I had never seen anything like this before. American picnic tables are usually in the grass, and if they are near a river, they are next to it and not on it. These fun and social experiences were an important part of the educational experience because they gave people from different cultures a chance to connect. One of the most interesting aspects of my visit was staying in multiple places. I stayed with Nakyun, Jiwon, and Yeon. I really liked seeing each of their families and homes. I also enjoyed staying at the Buddhist temple. I will never forget making the bead necklace at 4 o'clock a.m., bowing and making a wish 108 times. Staying at all these places gave me a varied experience. I was always outside my comfort zone, in the learning zone, and I felt like I was constantly learning new things and being accepted by new people. This was an amazing feeling. Of everything that happened when I was in Korea and after we returned to Eugene, the most important educational and personal thing that happened was the relationships I built with the Korean students and my host parents in Korea. I am grateful for my experience in Korea and believe that it has contributed to my educational and personal growth. Thank you. Uh, and Abby lives, um, in the south, on, lives on Harris Street in South Eugene. Okay, great. great. I'm not sure who her counselor is. Hello, my name is Sukriti. I live at 491 Glen Glen Drive. So I had never before thought that I would get the chance to go to South Korea for an extended amount of time and really get the opportunity to immerse myself in the culture. When someone goes on vacation alone or just with family, they do not get a chance to achieve a full experience with a dip into the language, food, and history on a more personal level. When we were first embarking on the trip, I was pretty nervous as I had no idea what to expect. One of my greatest worries had to do with food, as I'm a vegetarian and I heard about how much meat was incorporated into every meal. When we arrived, the families greeted us with so much joy and welcomed us to Jinju. It was such a warm greeting after the long flight and it was almost as if we were old friends reuniting. Arriving at our host family's house, we got a chance to see the architecture of the city and just some basics about how the people lived and some of their customs. As the weeks progressed, this understanding grew further. Each day included new and interesting events for our group. Some days we went to a historical museum filled with ancient artifacts and information about South Korea's rich past. 
One of my favorite activities had to be the overnight stay in a Buddhist temple. There we were taught by a monk about the proper bows inside the temple and some more daily practices. We took a very serene hike in, through the woods and also enjoyed fresh watermelon, a fruit which we had almost every day. We also got a chance to go to our host sibling school for one day. It was certainly interesting to go to an all-girls school, but I loved meeting all the girls and was amazed at how talented they all were. Another activity I enjoyed was the traditional dancing. Many cultures have dance as an integral part of their heritage. Korea also follows this trend. Some wonderful women led us through one specific dance, although I would have loved to learn a couple more. We also went to a Confucian school where we got the chance to wear the traditional Korean dresses and learn the proper etiquette for sitting, eating, and addressing someone. Around the end of the trip, all 10 of us went to Seoul for a few days before we flew back home. In Seoul, one of our most enjoyable experiences was the amusement park called Lotte World. Part of it was actually indoors, and there were many rides which I had never seen before. We went to many other places before leaving Korea and saying goodbye to our chaperone, Mr. Ha. Arriving in Eugene, the Korean students first spent a couple of days in Seattle before they came to our house. I was very excited to show my host sister, Yeyun, all I could in our two weeks here. We developed a deeper bond as I introduced her to some of my friends and also explained some newer things to her. We went rafting together, which is a new experience for me as well. As the two weeks wrapped up, I was rather sad to say goodbye to the new friends I had developed such strong relations with. Overall, the opportunity to go as an exchange student to South Korea was truly incredible. The people that I met were so kind and welcoming, and the experience is honestly unforgettable. I hope that the Korean students enjoy this program as much as I did and learn something about the way of life here. And I cannot pl wait to plan a reunion sometime in the future and share memories with this amazing group. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Haley Smith, and I go to Willamette High School, and I live on U uh, Elizabeth Street. Would you pull the microphone down close to you? There you go. There you Perfect. Go. Uh, my experience experience with the sister city program Eugene and Jinju was absolutely amazing. I got to experience the life and culture of a different country, especially since South Korea is such a small country making it easier to see. I was able to experience their life firsthand. I explored many cities in Korea, Gyeongju uh, being one of my favorites. We visited many museums and very memorable places like the Temple Stay and the bit where we visited our host uh, partner school. During the Temple Stay, we, had a, uh, we met the head monk bowed 108 times to make a necklace and hiked a mountain. I also learned about the history of South Korea and went to a Korean War Museum, which I got to see a more of a detailed and a personal experience. One of my favorite places to visit was the Botanical Garden and the Dinosaur Museum. At the Botanical Garden, we got to see many tropical plants that were huge. At the Dinosaur Museum, we got to see the types of dinosaurs and how they lived. We finished with uh, sliding down the lawn side at, uh, to the bottom of the hill. I found those to be quite interesting and fun. I got to try new food in which I got my dad to make some of the foods, mostly meat. It was fascinating to learn and become a part of a different family. They took care of me and helped me with a lot of my experience there. I also enjoyed being helped and toured around by Mr. Hall. He took care of us and made the trip a lot more fun. Uh, I befriended the Korean students and even their own friends too. I talked at least to one of them every day. This whole experience with the Sister City program is something that I can never forget and always talk about. I really appreciate everyone that helped with this experience that was so fun and eye-opening. I really do hope the Sister City program of Eugene and Chinju <coughs> and hope others get to visit and experience what we've, I've done. I will definitely try my absolute best in the future to help in later events from next students. Thank you so much, and thank you all for sharing your experiences. It was very interesting and uh, makes us all want to visit, I'm sure. So thank you very much. We are now ready for the public forum. Uh, the public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the city council on any city-related issues except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have two minutes. We have 51 speakers today, so we would like to you to contain your thoughts in two minutes. When you come to the podium, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward, if known. The timer and lights indicate the time you have to speak. The red light will indicate two minutes. Uh, I also want to um, just suggest that if you can speak in less than two minutes, that would be great. Um, 
if someone speaks on the same topic and basically says what you plan to say, you might consider just taking a pass so that we can get through other speakers who have something, a different topic to talk about. So any way in which you uh, can collaborate with one another and help mm -hmm. us so that everybody gets to talk about the issue and we also as a city council have some work to do at the end and we'd like to close at 10. So just those prompts help us if you can to be, um, to work our way through this process and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. First up is Howard Saxion, followed by Eric Such Suchman. Suchman. Uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, Councillors. My name is Howard Saxon. I reside in Ward 8 in Eugene, and I chair the Sustainability Commission. I'm here on behalf of the Commission. This, the Sustainability Commission at its January 18th meeting endorsed a draft zoning overlay for the proposed Clear Lake urban growth boundary expansion. The Clear Lake expansion proposal supports Eugene's economic future, provides a zoning overlay that will, that will prevent the siting of incompatible commercial and industrial facilities, and addresses equity for current and future residences. The commission participated in the ad hoc committee that uh, created, helped in the creation of the, the uh, draft zoning overlay, and we received multiple briefings by city staff. We want to commend the staff on their exhaustive attention to detail in developing this proposal and on the inclusive process they used to address the concerns of West Eugene residents. The Commission evaluated the proposal from a triple uh, bottom line perspective, which we provided in a document to you. The uh, expansion creates larger tracts of industrial zone land and includes provisions that ensure that those large tracts remain available for use intended. It also states it states its intent to build upon Eugene's competitive advantages and recognizes the community's values around climate change, sustainability, local food systems, and natural resources, and prohibits specific industrial uses incompatible with these objectives. Through these provisions, the proposal serves plans, Eugene's plans for regional economic prosperity. The Clear Lake uh, Overlay Zone shows a commitment to environmental justice for residents of West Eugene that is unprecedented in Oregon land use planning. By prohibiting incompatible uses outright, by citing higher impact uses away from residential and public use, by establishing rigorous performance metrics, and by involving affected residents in the development area, the um, overlay proposal made major strides towards social equity and planning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric Suchman, followed by Seth Sadovsky. Hi, good evening. My name is Eric Suchman. I'm a teacher at North Eugene High School. I'm a resident of Eugene. I'll keep my comments brief. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I'm here to speak in support of a strong sanctuary city ordinance for the city of Eugene. As a history teacher, I often ask my students to continue the way future history books will tell the story of our time. Over the last several years, and in many cases months, communities around the nation have passed ordinances declaring themselves to be sanctuary cities, counties, and states. San Francisco, Berkeley, Austin, Denver, Boston, Madison, Minneapolis, Nashville, Philadelphia, Portland, Santa Fe. When the civil rights history books are written about our time, these communities will be remembered as taking a courageous stand in support of human rights and against intolerance. What will the history books say about Eugene? What story will be told about our community? Passing a sanctuary city ordinance will not solve all of the problems that we face today, but it is a step forward. And I know that many members of our community need us to take a step forward right now. Please move quickly, pass an ordinance declaring Eugene to be a sanctuary city, and make our community a safer place. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, no, you can always do this, but no, no outbursts of any sort, positive or negative. Seth, and then followed by Todd Kaiser. Hi, I'm Seth Sadowski. I live in Ward 2. Um, the city faces many challenges in developing, development and planning right now including affordable housing and housing affordability, how to deal with e-website re redevelopment, and how to accommodate future growth in housing, commercial, and other land uses, and how to work toward climate recovery and also Vision Zero. I was heartened to hear missing middle housing highlighted as something to encourage in Mayor Venice's State of the City address. 
middle housing is anything from a duplex to a small apartment complex, basically in the middle between single family and large apartment complexes. Implementing a neighborhood planning process for a refinement plan to work on a small number of tax lots facing South Willamette Street and 29th Avenue will not help to solve any of these problems. When this planning area was narrowed to include only the commercial stretch of South Willamette, which is already zoned C2 or R3, the chance to do anything that will help solve the problems I mentioned above is gone. The area is nearly all currently developed, so any improvements that are chosen in a planning process will literally take decades to bear fruit. Upzoning any of this area is likely to be a non-starter with neighborhood groups, and is likely useless because there's no room to develop anything that would not meet the current rules. Downzoning any of this area will just make it harder for any potential redevelopment, which will only contribute to cause more pain in our overall growing pains. The plan is exclusionary with regard to who may participate in this supposedly public process. Planning staff have done what they could with the direction they were given to try to come up with a workable solution. However, there's no way forward with this process that will do more good than harm, let alone be a cost-effective use of staff time. When you meet to discuss this on March 8th, please redirect your planning staff to work on projects that can implement Envision Eugene and work towards solving our city's problems. Thank you. Thank you. Todd Kaiser, followed by Kathy Bond. <clears throat> Hello, I'm from Ward 4, George Pollings District. I am also here to talk in favor of a strong sanctuary <clears throat> resolution. Uh, I think it's very important from a human rights perspective and that we set a good example, particularly with some of the events recently in our city with the different kinds of graffiti, uh, first in the Asian dif districts and now recently with our, uh, the uh, Nazi symbols. We need to make a statement for this city. What kind of place do we want to live in? What kind of statement do we want to make as far as how we want to protect the people who live here, who have families that have children? There are real consequences and we can do something to prevent bad consequences in this area. So I urge you to make a strong resolution to protect the people who live here and the families that we live and work and are friends with. I want to change the topic shortly just because of the fact that we've also had a very uh, tough winter where we've had five people die on our streets. This isn't acceptable. We need to do something more. And George, we don't call anybody the things that you've been calling them. That's not right. These are people that are trying to live and we need to do better by them. This is where we need to, to again, look at our humanity, protect our citizens, whether they have a shelter or not. They are not to be disparaged publicly the way you did. That's not right. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Bond, followed by Eliza Kaczynski. Good evening. My name is Kathy Bond and I live in the fourth ward. I have been asked to speak to you today by some of the most vulnerable members of this community and also by the family and friends of the latest victim, pardon me, Hunter Hand. I've spent the last eight months studying the homeless issues here in this town. Many were victims of the recession who, for one reason or another, were not able to get back on their feet. Some have turned to drugs. A lot of the people left out there are disabled, whether physically or mentally. We've all been uh, witnesses to that. These people have done not deserve to be treated so poorly. I have watched I've watched EPD, I've watched as uh, the police forces push these people further from the few resources left available. They are told they must move or risk getting fines they can't afford to pay. When, they're at, when they ask where they can go, EPD responds with answers such as, there's room at the mission, only if PD takes you, 
and uh, go where you can't be seen. I've heard both of these directly out of the police officer's mouths. And that's if they don't write you a ticket. Um, they're still <laughs> writing tickets for illegal camping. Even if you can't find them in your dispatch log, I know. I've taken a picture of it. I've sent it into the Human Rights Commission. We're violating their rights. We're not allowing them to even sleep anywhere without threats of jail or fines. This has to stop. These are 70% uh, of the homeless here are from here. They're not strangers. They're your old co workers, your old neighbors. And I'm tired of watching my friends die. I've known three of those five people. I knew them because I cared enough to go down and see what the problems were. Every time, thank you. Thank you. Eliza Kaczynski, followed by Heidi Fixdad. Hello, I'm Eliza Kaczynski. I'm a Ward 1 resident and I'm a member of We Can. While we appreciate the efforts that both staff and neighborhood leaders have put into refining, for lack of a better word, the South Willamette Initiative proposal for a refinement plan, we feel that continuing to focus on South Willamette requires too much investment for far too little positive impact. We feel that City Council, instead of directing staff to continue along this road, should halt this process and focus energies on efforts that will have a greater positive effect on the city as a whole. With the narrowing of the scope of the project, the elements of the project that addressed missing middle housing and housing affordability have effectively been removed. What remains is a focus on improving the pedestrian experience on Willamette itself. While we can, as the Walkable Eugene Citizen Advisory Network, obviously is a strong supporter of pedestrian, the ex pedestrian experience, we must note that as part of the pavement project on Willamette, scheduled for next year, there is a two million award of federal funds for pedestrian improvements on Willamette Street. These improvements will happen with or without an additional refinement planning process. There are other areas of Eugene where this kind of planning work is needed, and instead of putting all our eggs in the South Willamette basket, we should be sharing these resources with other areas that would, where they would go to better use. In addition, there, at this point, there are still too many unknowns to create a decent estimate of what effort will be involved in this. Staff has produced a proposed timeline, but we should note that this project has already taken almost seven years. And even this small piece of it has taken several months longer than initially proposed. We can members have as individuals invested a significant time and effort into the South Willamette question. And it is difficult to say this, but at this point it feels like we are throwing good money after bad. Thank you. Thank you. Heidi Fixstad, followed by Mariana Peridones. Good evening, council members. My name is Heidi Fixstad, and I live in Ward 2. I'm one of three of the owners of Moss Crossing, a dispensary in the friendly area. Uh, I'd like to thank you, first off, for voting to move forward with the work session regarding the 1,000-foot buffer between uh, recreational dispensaries in the city. Uh, you've heard myself and other local dispensary owners stand up here many times to relay the importance of the 1,000-foot buffer to our local cannabis industry. This time I'd like to stress the time sensitivity of the issue. Since OLCC's licensing began in October, four new shops within 1,000 feet of an existing dispensary have opened their doors. Five more are pending licensing and slated to open in the coming weeks, and two others are in the application process. That's 11 shops in four months that would not be allowed to receive a license were the buffer in place. In other words, that's a 33% increase in four months. On High Street, there are dispensaries opening up on either side of McMinimins, literally two doors down from each other. Uh, as a dispensary owner, I've been made acutely aware of the public opinion on this issue, <laughs> and Eugene does not want a dispensary on every corner. Please move forward quickly with reinstating this buffer as every other municipality in the state has. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mariana Perdones. Followed by Sue Sierra Lupe. 
Thank you. For the record, my name is Mariana Paredones. I'm a student commissioner on the Higher Education Coordinating Commission and a co-chair for the Oregon Students of Color Coalition and a resident of Springfield. I'm here today to urge support for Sanctuary City Movement and urge you to support in favor of claiming Eugene as a sanctuary city. I came here to the U.S. when I was five years old with my family seeking protection, but when we asked for um, refugee status, it was denied because of Mexico's deal with the U.S. with NAFTA. Um, my mother made the difficult decision to stay here in the U.S. fully knowing that she might never see home again and even some of our family members, but she did this to protect our family from potential danger that we were facing back in Mexico. There have been 600 people arrested by ICE, Immigration Customs and Enforcement, within just this, these past few weeks. And it's alarming to know that even here in Oregon, the presence of ICE has been creating fear within our residents and within our community. People of Eugene and Oregonians need to understand that we are your neighbors too, we pay taxes too, we are classmates, coworkers, and we are a part of what makes the city diverse. In 2010, during the DREAM Act battle, we came out as undocumented, unafraid, and now in 2016, we are coming out again to say we're undocumented, unafraid, and resilient. We will keep fighting for permanent protection, dignity, and respect, and we believe that we will win. We have thousands of people that are rising up against racism and white supremacy, and for us, it's more than just claiming our, our lives as humans. It's about creating a safety hazard for even our youth. It is about showing all undocumented immigrants that even under a Trump presidency, there are communities rising up and putting their bodies in line to protect the most vulnerable. Just this past week, Lane Community College passed a uh, passed a policy to make our campus sanctuary campus. I organized a walkout back in November um, with students where we uh, met with the president and we hope that Eugene will follow Sue and that we'll make this safe place for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sue Sierra Lupe, followed by uh, Arwen Moss Despain. My name is Susie Lupe, and I live in Ward 1, and I am also the clinic manager for Occupy Medical, and have been for the last five years. I uh, have noticed that lately people have been a little forgetful about their history here in Eugene. Um, not so long ago, I believe it was 1997 that I recall it, we had a lot more public space available. And a lot of that was um, some of the larger trees were cut down and many of the public spaces were changed. Uh, we have lost public bathrooms. Um, we have lost a lot of public seating for people. So what's happened instead is um, with the economy having trouble, we've had a f far and the um, lack of uh, support for education, we have a lot more people that are showing up on the streets. And rather than sitting on benches, they're now sitting on sidewalks. Um, rather than being able to be in public parks where they can rest or by riversides, they're getting a lot more pressure to condense into smaller and smaller places. So you see a, a great deal of people protesting at more folks funneling, being forced to funnel downtown where there are resources if they can get to them. And then folks that live or work downtown are upset because they see this funnel effect. The way to fix that is not to say, I'm sorry, you can't be homeless in public. The way to fix that is to offer more resources. Rather than offering less, which causes and exacerbates homelessness, you offer more resources. This is a smart use of, of my taxpayer money. And what I would like to see instead is for you guys to triage your time a little more effectively. I do not want to keep coming here uh, month after month talking about how the people that I treat are suffering and dying because of neglect, and you guys are talking about dogs. Thank you. Arwen Moss Despain, followed by Kristen Yaris. My name is Arwen Moss Despain. I reside in Ward 1, and I volunteer with Occupy Medical. I'm here to talk about my concerns related to the rest stops. And if you hear frustration or urgency in my voice, it's because I lost three of my street folks in the last month to death due to homelessness. And we've lost over 26 in the last year. 
I support rest stops as temporary and transition housing, but we need to simultaneously work on two other critical levels of need, emergency housing in the form of public shelters that can include daytime use, and permanent housing that can be afforded by people on SSI and minimum wage. I'm disturbed to learn this evening that NHS management was not consulted in the development of the plan to disperse their camp. You need to involve unhoused people in the planning and implementation of any program, just as you would end users of anything else, just like your wayfinding program and any other thing meant to serve the public. I'm concerned that rest stops are the only effort on the table when the needs are far greater and more urgent. I am concerned that the rest stop effort is meant to sweep unhoused people from the public eye for 2021 without real efforts to change the conditions for folks on the ground that we serve every weekend. I am, you know, listen to your wayfinding presentation with great interest. Uh, because it's how we create our public space and our sense of place. I find it particularly striking when looking at how we treat unhoused people in the public space and it begs the question, who is this space actually for? There's a lot of language around us and them, those that belong in the space and those that don't. There's language about downtown becoming more safe and comfortable and useful. And I assure you that the unhoused people I work with want the very same thing. So I want you to reject the idea that unhoused people are different than yourselves or less worthy of that public space. And I want you to work more comprehensively so we can prevent more deaths. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen Yaris followed by David Strand. Good evening, I live in Ward 5. This is not the first time I've given public testimony on the need to support a sanctuary city ordinance here in Eugene. As with many of my friends and neighbors gather here tonight, we've been pushing to make this declaration since last November's elections. Frankly, Eugene is falling behind rapidly, other municipalities and states from Corvallis to California, and we must catch up now. The time has passed to declare with no degree of uncertainty that Eugene welcomes immigrants and refugees and will seek to protect all members of our community, regardless of their immigration status. Yes, the stakes are high, as recent executive orders and the discourse coming out of the White House has made it clear that Trump and his administration will use threats of withholding of federal funds. But we need you to stand for the spirit of welcome and refuge that founded the best democratic traditions in this country. And Eugene will not be alone in doing so, because when trigger happy Twitter fingers threaten to withhold federal funds, along with cities and states up and down the West Coast and across this country, who have joined the sanctuary movement, Eugene will find support in lawyers, activists, ag advocates, friends, and allies. So instead of fearing the removal of federal funds, cities and municipalities in Oregon should take California's lead and investigate the possibility of Oregon refusing to support this federal regime with our tax dollars. As a faculty member and one of five sponsors of the UO Faculty Senate Resolution passed on November 16th to make UO a sanctuary campus, I would also encourage Eugene to go further than a mere declaration or order Ordinance. In these times, what we've heard, when immigrant families and communities are under siege, facing real threats of raids and deportations, Eugene should take concrete steps such as setting up a hotline, know your rights trainings, providing free immigration assistance to families in schools and community centers and libraries, helping families establish safety plans in case of raids or deportations. Thank you. Thank you. David Strand, followed by Ellen Firstner. Good evening, counselors. Thank you for your time. I'm David Strayan, live just east of here, and I'm employed in Ward 1. <clears throat> Apparently not over the cold yet. It was interesting sitting here listening to uh, our counselors talk, and in particular, Counselor Zelenka, about how we're not prepared for a FEMA-scale emergency like what we're seeing happening in California. Simple solution to that. Get FEMA money, build a shelter. I've been hearing for weeks, and I've actually encouraged the council to reach out and expand the rest stop program. Instead, we're closing one. Simple, simple answer. Expand housing options, emergency and transitional. Right now, when you're looking at the cheapest apartment for a student, $950, that's above the income level of anybody here working a minimum wage job within this city. We can't continue to do that. A community is only as strong as its weakest citizens. When we're calling our unsheltered citizens garbage, that sticks in the throats of people and there create consequences within the community. 
creates dissension within the community, and that's not how our counselors should be treating our, our le lowest income residents. You guys were asked to reach out and expand the rest stop program to the other communities. I'd love a question and answer from anybody that's reached out to other communities to talk to other mayors about the rest stop program and been a spokesman for it. I dare challenge anybody to raise their hand and say they have. You guys were treating our homeless with ridiculous rules that are already covered, dog ordinances and smoking ordinances that are already covered because we're targeting our travelers. I know some of our city employees that came here as travelers looking for work, and they're still here. There's some people who don't want them here, but guess what? They're still here. Travelers are citizens. Let's find out what they really want. If, they're, if their behavior is an issue, let's address the behavior. You can't ban dogs downtown. Now how's somebody going to open up a dog grooming business downtown? How are people going to move into town? I'm for a sanctuary city. I think we need to continue to follow along that model, and that includes our lowest income residents and our newest residents. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen Firstner, followed by Carol Shearer. Good evening. My name is Ellen Firstner, and I live in Marcola, but I identify with Eugene as my city. I came here last time to speak to you about becoming a sanctuary city, and I'm here again for the same reason. Last time I told you I am an immigrant, and although I am documented, it has put a fear in my heart. Now, two weeks later, things have gotten much crazier, and now I'm here to talk to you about our youth and the fear in their hearts. Particularly, I am speaking about and for foster kids. I am a foster parent through a program in Eugene. Foster kids are the rubbish of our society. They are the kids no one wants or knows what to do with. They are the wards of the government who does not really care about them and does not know what to do with them. Some of these foster kids here are of Hispanic or Latino background. And once again, they hear the government is not on their side. They live in fear for themselves, for their families, for their friends. By adopting the ordinance to make Eugene a sanctuary city, you give these kids a measure of safety, a knowledge that not the whole country is against them and that they will be protected. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Shearer, followed by Janet, um, no last name. Talking about, well, we'll get there. Carol, thank you. I'm Carol Shearer, I'm in Chris Pryor's ward. I'm here because I'm concerned about safety of people and also well, welfare of children as well. And I'm going to read a message from a friend. My husband is an un undocumented immigrant. He came from Mexico walking across the desert at 16. In 2008, he was picked up by immigration and while in holding, he was offered voluntary departure. This is essentially pleading guilty without a court trial and he was sent back to Mexico. He tried to stay in Mexico, but the drug cartel had strengthened so much there. Daily he saw people disappear and murdered, so he was convinced he should take the risk and cross again. We talked to lawyers about options to obtain legal, legal status for him. We have, never, we have been told there were no options for him to do it the right way. We have four children who he financially supports. He is a part of our church community and a benefit to his company. We are working to start our own business as we are constantly worried about his job finding out his documents are false, so he would suddenly be without work. We have talked about returning to Mexico together, but we are very worried about the violence. We are told that on Christmas morning, multiple decapitated bodies were found in the street from the drug cartel. Young girls 10 to 13 years old are being forced to become the girlfriends of the town's mafia bosses. My husband doesn't want our children and me to follow him if he gets sent back again. He prefers to sacrifice being with his family than to risk us becoming part of the casualties there. Every day I worry until he walks through the door. I fear the day that I will need to tell our children he won't be home that night or anytime soon. My heart breaks that my own country has a plan to destroy a family that is doing no harm and is a benefit to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Janet Ayers, followed by Jennifer Frenzer-Knowlton. Hey, I'm going to try to just 
bullet some things. First, I'm very opposed to sanctuary cities. I don't think there's a clear enough definition or the ramifications of a city becoming sanctuary. I support legal immigration, bullet one. Bullet two, I'm hoping that the city will realize what their policies and inactions or effective inactions in addressing the trespassing of public lands. Public lands are not the solution to housing. It's a separate matter, let me be clear. And although I, I am a resident, tax-paying citizen of Whitaker, my property has gone down in value this year. I had a visitor on my porch at one o'clock in the morning, and when I called the dispatch, I was told that there's just a thin sheet of glass, and as you can tell, I'm somewhat disabled right now. I live alone, and I was told by dispatch that they would uh, have an officer there when they had one available. And I said, never mind, I'll be getting my heat. Of course I wasn't, but within 40 seconds, there were no fewer than six patrol cars outside my door. That being said, I'm fully aware that Eugene, this city of our size, is greatly understaffed with law enforcement. If a city wants to sit on this, people using our public lands, our parks, our sidewalks for their housing, get law enforcement. We need at least 50 more officers in this city right now, and I understand it takes up to two years to get one trained and out on the streets, streets with the proper training. If the city's gonna sit and table and play Band-Aid politics with this hot issue, I suggest you get more officers. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Frenzer Knowlton, followed by Charlie Swanson. I'm Jennifer Frenzer Knowlton, and I'm in Betty Taylor's ward. Um, two items tonight, I'm gonna to talk about the sanctuary city and also um, homelessness. Thank you for your work on both these issues. Um, <clears throat> please move forward with the sanctuary city ordinance as quickly as possible. The ordinance might um, explain some of the previous speaker's um, concerns if she could get a draft in her hands. And um, I think that's very important that we have a hearing and we set a hearing date. And um, the, the news of the uh, ICE raids are alarming. And alarmed citizens are not the kinds of citizens who are going to be cooperating with law enforcement if they're frightened. So please, public safety is at risk and the, uh, the state laws are, there is a campaign to repeal them. So those protections are not permanent. Um, an, an ordinance in our town is vital. On the topic of downtown com commerce and the unhoused, I think the two ordinances you're considering about banning dogs and smoking are not a good use of your power to enact ordinances. If in fact, the, I find these a pretense, laws that seem to be neutral and beneficial and keep getting casted in that way, but that's not what they are. There are ways, these are more ways to disperse the unhoused. They're contrived and it's enforcement that is a misuse of public funds and a misuse of taxpayers' money. Instead, we need to work on places for people to go. You can't disperse people to nowhere. That's not gonna work, and it won't help your commerce one bit. So please, find places for people to rest and support the Right to Rest Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie Swanson, followed by Kathleen Phillip. Hello, I'm Charlie Swanson. I live in Ward 3. Um, I'm representing Healthcare for All Oregon, which is a coalition over 120 organizations working together towards universal, publicly funded health care. We're asking the council to help Oregon take a step towards more equitable, affordable, high quality health care accessible to everyone in the state. Better health care for more people for less money. Specifically, we're asking the council to pass a resolution urging the Oregon legislature to create a transparent public process to design a health care system that provides timely access to comprehensive health care for all Oregon <laughs> residents. When the Affordable Care Act, or the ACA, was passed, we knew that it would do good things for millions of people, especially with the expansion of Medicaid. 
But we also knew that it had systemic problems, keeping health care, health insurance largely a function of employment, not doing anything to simplify administration within the system, and doing little to address high and rapidly rising overall costs. Now the ACA and even the Medicaid expansion portion are under threat of being repealed, and there's talk of replacement. While we and a majority of Americans agree that the best replacement would be an approved and expanded Medicare for all, we suspect Congress may not choose that path. <laughs> Congress may well choose to have states take more responsibility for designing their own health care system. The Oregon legislature has been considering this for some time. In 2013, they laid out principles of a universal health care system. They funded a study of financing such a system in 2015. <clears throat> And they chose RAND, the RAND Corporation to do the research. RAND released a report in January, finding that single payer is the only option studied that would achieve universal coverage and not increase costs. Single payer is the only option that significantly reduces financial barriers to care. Single payer, thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Phillip, followed by Max Rink. Good evening. Uh, Kathleen Phillip from Ward 7, and I would like to continue what my uh, person from pre previous to me uh, stated. Uh, Senator Michael Dembro of Portland has proposed a task force to take the next step toward universal health care in Oregon. This task force would answer questions about how to implement such a plan. We are asking you to encourage our legislature to create this task force. Other communities in Oregon have weighed in on this matter. Last October, the Portland City Commissioners unanimously passed a resolution similar to what we are asking of Eugene. In the November election, 75% of the voters in Corvallis answered yes to the question, shall the Oregon legislature, through a public process, develop a health care system that serves all Oregonians? An even greater 83% of Ashland voters said yes, to shall, shall Ashland voters encourage the 2017 Oregon legislature to design an improved comprehensive health care system for Oregon? Legislators are more likely to agree to take the next step if even more communities let them know it's important. We are asking the Eugene City Council to add their voice to the voices of these communities. It will take some time to design a functional universal health care system in Oregon, and it will be best if the legislature keeps the process moving forward. The RAND study and its findings should not just lay on the shelf unused and ignored. We have collected signatures from around Eugene for well, from well over 600 people who agree with us. The legislature should continue to move forward towards a universal health care system in Oregon. Thank you. Thank you. Max Rink, followed by Maria Bybee. Hello, my name is Max Rink. I live in Councilors of Lankers Ward. I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the Sanctuary City Ordinance. Um, I am a U.S. citizen, naturalized from England. I'm an immigrant. My mother has been an immigrant twice over. My father is an immigrant. My grandfather and great-grandparents were refugees from Belarus. Uh, it took them five years to get from Belarus finally to Canada where they became productive, integrated members of the society there. Uh, I have great-grandparents on the other side who came from Austria due to persecution of Jews in Austria and settled in England and also became productive members of the society there. Um, the previous speakers have already said, I think, most of what needs to be said about the ordinance itself. Given the current political climate, um, you have to do everything that you can to resist the scapegoating which is being attempted at a national level in this time. So please, please adopt that ordinance with all due haste. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Bybee, followed by Amy Keir. Hi, my name is Maria Bybee, and I live in Emily Simple's ward. 
In these dark political times, I want Eugene to be a place where steps are being taken to create a better community and world. To that end, I ask that the City Council move forward as quickly as possible in making Eugene a sanctuary city. I also ask that the con that concrete steps be taken towards funding and building a public homeless shelter that will offer compassionate and comprehensive care for our unhoused neighbors. Finally, I ask that the City Council take every action in their power to protect our environment, including making progress on Eugene's climate recovery ordinance and following the example of Seattle and Davis by divesting from U.S. Bank due to its support of DAPL. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Kerr followed by Sophie Bybee. Good evening, my name is Amy Keir and I live in Ward 1. First, I want to voice my strong support to make Eugene a sanctuary city. I urge you to act with urgency and compassion. Second, please address the issue of homelessness and consider the creation of public shelters and other measures that other folks have mentioned tonight. I volunteer regularly at Egan Warming Center, and I see that we have a humanitarian crisis in Eugene. I invite the mayor, city council members, the city manager, and owners of downtown businesses to spend a night volunteering at Egan. You will meet a wide range of people who are kind, intelligent, and grateful for a warm, dry place to stay. They are dealing with a multitude of issues, mental illness, addiction, unemployment, medical issues, as well as simple things like how to maintain personal hygiene or find a pair of dry socks. I do not believe that solely investing in a greater police presence downtown will solve this. This humanitarian crisis must be addressed with an investment in social services, including public shelter. I invite the mayor and city council to join with the downtown business community and others to be part of a comprehensive solution. I would gladly volunteer to serve on a task force and work on solutions with you. Let's make sure that all members of our community can live in safety, security, and dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Sophie Bybee, followed by Caitlin Bowman. Hello, my name is Sophie Bybee and I live in Emily Semple's ward. I'm here today to ask the City Council to take rapid and emphatic action to strengthen Eugene as a site of compassionate resistance against the new federal policies. To do so, we need to move forward quickly with the Climate Recovery Ordinance. I also want to urge Eugene to divest from U.S. Bank, a bank financing a pipeline that is creating both a humanitarian and environmental crisis. I would also like to voice my support for making Eugene a sanctuary city, and I encourage the drafting committee to work quickly towards a strongly worded ordinance to that effect. Finally, I want to respond to the comments made at the last city council meeting by the Downtown Business Association. We do not need to be protected from the homeless, but rather find better ways of serving them. We need expanded rest stops in every ward and a publicly funded shelter. To me, these are things worth paying higher taxes for, showing up to city, city council for, and fighting for. Thank you. Thank you. Caitlin Bowman, followed by David Piccioni. My name is Caitlin Bowman, and I am a resident of Ward 7. I'm here to voice my support for a publicly funded shelter. More needs to be done to address the needs of the unhoused in our community and alleviate the underlying causes of homelessness. Simply increasing the police presence downtown will not help to accomplish this goal. A public shelter would be a practical and compassionate step towards addressing this great need in our city. Thank you. Thank you. David, followed by Marsha McQueen, maybe? Hi, I'm David Ivan Piccioni. Uh, I would, uh, I'm a representative of uh, Healthcare for All Oregon and Eugene Springfield Solidarity Network, and I'm here asking you to, along with Corvallis, Ashland, and Portland, uh, declare Eugene a city that's uh, in support of single payer or universal health coverage. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, which some people like because it covered 32 million more people, would be expanded to cover everybody. And what people don't like about, about the Affordable Care Act, which is that it uh, takes, uh, that it, uh, uh, that it uh, pillages the, 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 <laughs> 
it, it takes money from the for it for, forget it. All right. Uh, I'm kind of a little lost here with my mind. So the uh, pharmaceutical companies are making a lot of money off of sick people, and the uh, insurance industries, that's the name I was looking for, are making a lot of money. With uh, universal health care co coverage, uh, th this problem would be eliminated to, to from, 30, th from 33 percent down to 3 uh, percent. The study that was done, HB 2828, proved that uh, uh, single payer would be the best way to cover the most number of people for the le least amount of money in the best possible way. Thank you. Thank you. Mar Martic McQueen, you'll have to ex decipher, and followed by Reverend Adam Biddle. Yeah, my name is Marty McQueen. I'm a resident of, uh, of, of Ward 1. I live and work in Ward 1, and I'm a, an immigration attorney. And I wanted to share with the, the council a, a particular example of why we need a sanctuary city. I have a friend who, um, who was arrested on a nonviolent uh, a domestic dispute, some sort of thing that uh, you, know, you or I would spend perhaps a night in jail. Now, she, um, because she was a foreign national, the ICE uh, was contacted and asked if they could hold on to the, the local, uh, the local uh, enforcement, the law enforcement agency could hold on to uh, this particular person um, until they did an investigation to see whether or not this person was here undocumented or in violation of uh, immigration laws. She was held in in uh, in jail for 15 days while the um, ICE uh, fig finally figured out that she was here uh, against uh, immigration laws. She was then transferred to Tacoma uh, Detention Center where she spent four months. Meanwhile, she lost her job, she lost her house, she lost her car. Her kids were taken away by the father and taken to Mexico, and she had to fight to get these uh, kids back, including going back uh, and having somebody go and get her kids for her. Her life was destroyed for something that would have taken, you know, any one of us uh, a uh, one night in jail. Um, this is is exactly why we need this sort of thing. Why? The, the city of Eugene needs a sanctuary city, or it needs to be a sanctuary city, and we need to uh, uh, limit our resources in cooperating with ICE. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Reverend Adam Biddell, followed by Joel Iboa. Good evening, friends. Reverend Adam Bridell, First United Methodist Church. We're at 14th and Olive in Ward 1. Our members are across the across the city. Uh, we're affectionately referred to, affectionately, I think, as the, the Toaster Church, if you've seen us. I want to affirm uh, the need for Eugene to adopt a strong uh, sanctuary city posture, uh, not only in our faith tradition, but in so many faith traditions. Hospitality is a core value. Even though hospitality is rarely easy, uh, it's often hard, it's often risky, and after uh, taking the relatively innocuous step of hanging a banner in front of our church that expresses a welcome to immigrants and refugees, uh, we were then caught up in the, the tagging movement and uh, found a swastika on the corner of our building just a couple of days later. Uh, so we hope you will take on uh, the challenge of hospitality and make a radical and risky declaration knowing that your community stands behind you. Uh, we can't wait to stand behind you. Uh, thank you in advance uh, for your courage and uh, the time to speak tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Joel Iboa, followed by Roy Ward. Hello, my name is Jolie Boa, Ward 7. I come here today as the newly appointed coalition coordinator for CAUSA Oregon. CAUSA Oregon is Oregon's premier advocacy group for Latino immigrants. It is my responsibility to run the One Oregon Coalition. Our mission is to track 
anti-immigrant bills and ballot measures and stop them dead in their tracks. I am a son of immigrants. I am a son of Eugene. I have seen firsthand proof that immigrants and refugees have contributed to the health and well-being of our city. It is not very well known that Oregon has the fastest growing Latino population in the U.S. Given this fact, it's imperative that every resident in our city be treated with respect and dignity. Oregon already has a sanctuary law, and we should have our own separate ordinance. I will give you three reasons why. First, passing a sanctuary ordinance is a positive way to show our city government's values of inclusion, equality, and respect for all residents that call the Emerald City home. Second, passing a resolution clarifies and makes public Eugene's policy when it comes to interacting with immigrant, immigration enforcement. It's an uncertain time for many immigrant families. And many have been afraid to go to the courthouse, take their children to school, and go to local law enforcement for help. It's important, it's important that they understand that they won't be under threat of deportation just for calling the police. Lastly, a sanctuary city resolution strengthens the state law that currently exists and shows other cities in, the, in our great state of Oregon that we support it. Last week, I had the opportunity to see Governor Kate Brown sign the sanctuary city sanctuary ordinance for the whole state, and I hope that we will follow in her footsteps. Thank you. Thank you. Roy Ward, followed by Lucy Ninger. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Roy Ward. I'm from uh, Live in Betty Taylor's Ward. Um, I'm an immigrant from New Zealand. I arrived here seven years ago. And I will mention, um, for, for some of the other speakers here, that New Zealand, um, New Zealand is a, a country about the same size as Oregon, and we do have a universal health system, and I recommend it. <laughs> but, I, but, I'm, but I'm here to speak, to, I'm here to speak for the towards the sanctuary city. I've spoken before about how welcome I was made in Eugene um, as, as an immigrant, and how I feel that welcome sh should be available to everybody. But I, I've got a few things to add. Um, excuse me, this microphone's a little low. Um, I, I work for a um, small technology company. I'm the lead engineer, and both the, as the lead engineer um, and also the CEO, we are both immigrants. Um, and so, immigrants make, make our make us make our society culturally stronger. They make our society economically stronger. Um, it's it, there's a lot of value in having um, in, 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 in having mixing of cultures. Um, I'm not feeling quite as safe as I used to with the green card after the first, after the last few weeks. So I would I'm, I would urge the, the city council to make the strongest possible sanctuary city ordinance and, to, and get through. I know there's there's a process to go through, but get through it as quickly as we can to provide what, as much protection we can to, to 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 immigrants and any other disadvantaged groups or potentially disadvantaged groups such as um, the homeless, um, people with different gender identity, um, and there's, and, there's, and, and um, and minority religions. So thank you. Thank you. Lou Sinninger, followed by Wayne Martin. Mayor, Council, my name is Lou Sinninger. I'm glad to see you. And thank you for hearing us tonight. There's been a, a lot of good statements on a lot of issues. But uh, as you may know, I'm a past AFSCME representative who represented the city of Eugene employees. And I'm very proud of that. And I retired in 2009. And since that time, I became active in Healthcare for All Oregon. I'm here to ask you to pass that resolution. Uh, I think we have the 600 signatures on the sheet, one of these sheets, right there, 800, all right. Anyway, uh, while I was bargaining, <coughs> the main issue besides wages, and in fact came, came over wages, was health insurance. And every year I bargained, and I represented the, the city employees for over 10 years, every year I bargained, the benefits fell and the costs went up. That is not a healthy situation. So I know that 
health care is almost 25% of wages. So just imagine if we had single payer health care, health care for all, everybody in, nobody out, right? Um, if that costs 10 to 12% of payroll, just think how much money you would have extra to spend on public housing. All right, so um, and just think you'd get out of the, the health insurance business, right? I mean, you've got to have at least three FTE working on health insurance here. So I, I urge you very much to, uh, to pass the, oh. Thank you. Thanks. Wayne Martin, followed by Mel Height. Good evening, I'm Wayne Martin. I'm in George Poling's ward. Thank you for devoting time earlier this evening to a work session on homelessness. Insofar as the thrust of your previous work session in November was the goal of placing a rest stop in each of the city's wards, I'm truly hopeful that you are pleased to some extent with the movement you're, you yourselves are making. I know it's a big thing when you're pleased with the movement you're able to make. Um, I know from my own personal experience in ecumenical projects in Boston and Philadelphia that it made a big difference once we felt we had our feet moving and our priorities engaged. I also want to ask one simple thing of each of you. As a board member of Nightingale, I request that you please stop by our rest stop and take a tour and speak with some of our residents. There's nothing that can help you understand the daily challenges and nuances, notwithstanding the benefits and the savings in financial and social costs than an on-site personal visit. We on the board have worked without let-up since being entrusted with our sites by the county commissioners and staff to open those sites two and a half years ago. Last year, Michael Kinnison collaborated with Mayor Piercy and Nightingale to host their project called Everyone Matters. There was incredible and significant TV, live TV coverage for that event. With that visit, the mayor herself was able to discern the quality of life that Nightingale made available to people seeking to transition from life on the streets. The sheer volume of people on Eugene's downtown streets would and will be greatly decreased when you set up a rest stop in each ward. Thank you. Mel Height, followed by David Woken. I'm Mel Height. I'm speaking about the dog proposed dog ban. So speak. Thank you. Years ago, I took in a dog named Pebbles. She is such an amazing dog. Loves to cuddle, play, swim, and is always alert. An all-around amazing dog. Little did I know at that time how important this dog, who had been raised outside on the streets of Eugene, would be to me and a number of the young homeless I look after. A few months after I was taking care of Pebbles, she became the caretaker for me and a small group of people who would move around trying to find safe places to sleep. We couldn't sleep in town for fear of being arrested or ticketed. The first night being homeless, we slept on a tarp by the river with some blankets in the open. I woke up to Pebbles growling. A man was standing over us. She scared him away. This happened more times than I can count. If she hadn't protected us, we might have been one of those stories that you hear about in the paper or on the news, but probably not because those stories are rarely told. I was attacked by a man on 18th Street behind Walmart here in Eugene. I had bruising on my forehead, neck, face, and arms. I know I would have been a statistic if it wasn't for Pebbles who jumped in and bit the man saving my life. That man ended up in prison a short time later for stabbing someone. Two minutes doesn't allow me to tell you more stories of Pebbles being my guardian angel or how she kept us warm outside on the cold nights, but I can tell you this, to this day, I cannot sleep without her watching over me. This is what I will say. There are reasons 
people who don't live in a house have their dogs. Safety, warmth, and many other. A ban on dogs downtown is directly targeting people who have a legitimate need and exploiting that need in the name of separating of the classes, which to me sounds the same as separating of the races, because it is. Eugene is standing up to be a sanctuary city. That means sanctuary for all. No one is illegal. Stop making the homeless illegal. Leave their dogs alone. They are their safety security since you haven't stood up to be. Thank you. <clears throat> David Woken, followed by Ruth Demler. Thank you. Um, so I'm Ward 7. Uh, I'm also a faculty librarian at the University of Oregon and on the Executive Council of the United Academics. I've talked to you a few times. Um, so I just wanted to also, as many have here tonight, state our support for um, a strong sanctuary ordinance here in Eugene, Oregon. Um, we've had two strong victories last week. You already heard about how LCC is a sanctuary campus. Last November, University of Oregon similarly made this uh, similar decora declarations, instituted similar policies, which we are working and implementing as I speak at University of Oregon. At the same time, we are seeing uh, and <clears throat> stepping up of roundups of immigrants uh, across the country, as many of you have seen in the news. Um, this is of a piece of a broader criminalization and demonization of immigrants, uh, people of color, and soon enough, as we've seen with the executive orders today, LGBTQI people in the United States. This federal government is coming after people. Um, needs to be said. It's happening now. They're going to be in Eugene soon. Um, last weekend, I was proud, and well, yesterday, in fact, I was proud to stand alongside my neighbors from the Whitaker, um, repudiating fascists who sought to terrorize us in our neighborhood, feeling empowered by a far-right government in our federal, our federal government. Sanctuary is a piece of how this city can stand up against these kind of people. Uh, that's all. I respect your time. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth Demler, followed by Mark Shapiro. This has been a very difficult evening for all of us sitting here, but the difficulty that you must have on your shoulders and the responsibility of all the citizens here must be a very heavy weight, and I don't think it's going to get any lighter. It's, uh, we're going through some times. And one way I could really recognize the difference, I've been collecting signatures on issues and, and activists for as long as I can remember. But getting those resolutions, I got 400 of those 800 that you have in front of you, was so easy. I just had to mention health care, and people grabbed it out of my hands and signed it. They just are so concerned about what's going to happen to their health care and how they could prefer to have single payer like every other country but ours. Uh, people facing uh, the idea of precondition. And maybe that will be gone if we have it eliminated. We need to have some security. We need to have health care for every person here. Um, I would especially like to invite all of you to our event that's going to be this Sunday. It's going to be at the Unitarian Church at noon. And we're going to have an excellent film and then a short program after that. And maybe you can see a little bit more about the needs of our community and the needs of the people all over our nation. We are organized from one end of the country to the other, and we are making pleas in every state for single-payer health care plan. So I urge you also to pass this resolution now and see that we have it on our ballot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mark Shapiro, followed by Dennis Abir. Good evening. I'm Mark Shapiro. I've been a member of Health Care for Oregon for 17 years, trying to get universal health care for Oregon and for the rest of the United States. And I'm here to ask you, as Ruth just did, to support the resolution for a task force so the state can put together the best program possible to accomplish that. But I'd like to talk to you about the social determinants of health. It's an interesting term. It really goes two ways. Depending on people's health, the health of their families, the health of their children, what they can accomplish in life is very much under control of those conditions. And it goes the other way around. If 
uh, health care is not available to them when they need it. Their families can fall apart. They can fail to be able to perform at their jobs. All of these things are tied together. When Dr. Kissauver put the comprehensive care uh, program in place in our Medicaid system in Oregon, he got a waiver in place that allowed the system to provide more than just health care. It's able to identify other parameters, social parameters that it can provide so that the end result is better health, and health is what you're looking for, not health care. The state of Hawaii has just put into play a resolution declaring homelessness as a health condition. The point being that if it passes, then a doctor treating a Medicare patient will be able to prescribe shelter as the solution for the person's problems. Now, to me, this is very important because, A, the task force can do this, and, B, you need that as a solution. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Dennis Avir, followed by Michael Hajazi. Dennis Abair, Ms. Taylor's ward. I don't know whether you all saw Sunday's paper, but on the front page was a nice article about towering opposition about this proposed development in South Eugene. Um, I would like it if uh, city councilors and the mayor would have a town hall session at the Albertsons right next door to this and see what the people that live in the area really think about it. Um, I'm just going to make bullet points since you kind of blew a hole in my wonderful three-minute speech I had. Um, and that, number one, it is not an affordable housing project. He clearly states it's going to be high-end. Also, uh, it's going to be 62 feet tall, which is more than twice the height of the Albertsons there. A uh, wonderful aerial photo here, too, also that shows that the Albertsons is the only thing around there. Amazon Creek is across the park. Amazon Park, excuse me, Amazon Creek is right across the street. Amazon Park is right down the street. Everything else is residential. We realize that it is a C2 zoning, and that is something I, we feel that the city really blundered at and the planning division blundered at 20 or 30 years ago, proposing a potential of a 120-foot-tall building right at the edge of a residential area. And we fear not only that our area is being affected by it, but that all of your areas will potentially have this type of development trying to go in a mainly residential type of area that is in the neighborhoods. Um, there's several quotes in here about Envision Eugene and how it fits perfectly into that, but um, Envision Eugene talks about compact urban development. Well, if you look around, this is not an urban area. This is a suburban area. It has wonderful shops. It has wonderful stores. A couple of other things. Envision Eugene, protect, repair, and enhance neighborhood livability. This project does none of the above. Protect, restore, and enhance natural resources. We have the creek going right across there. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Michael Hajazi, followed by Michael Kerrigan. Uh, hello, Mayor Venice and Council. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you. My name is Michael Hajazi. I live in Ward 1 at 355 West 8th. Um, I, boy, you guys are so busy, and you do such a wonderful job, so I want to help. Uh, and so what I've been doing is thinking about some of the stuff you guys are thinking about. And the couple quick things that come to mind is that there's a really big storm coming in terms of uh, potentially the... Uh, uh, Junction City campus of the Oregon State Hospital, mental hospital closing, uh, quite possibly, and uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. So um, just looking at some of the things that are on your plate, my, my primary comment is that we're looking at the question of a sanctuary city, and I want to suggest that if a city is not a sanctuary, it's not a city, right? Okay. So, I don't know, like, if it's not a sanctuary, it's not a city, and it should probably either be left or burned. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Second quick comment, and then I'm done. So, the other thing you've been thinking about is uh, travelers, because you're city, right? So, you have, like, travelers, and you have people that are staying here. People travel by, some people stay. 
So um, I don't know. I don't know why we keep talking about homelessness. It's super confusing to me. Like, think about it, right? Who's homeless? Do you know any homeless people? I don't. Have you ever seen a homeless? Like, I've never seen a homeless person. We're all home. Welcome home, right? We're all home. So some of us are staying here, and some of us are traveling, right? You're talking about banning dogs and smoking, but it's traveling or you're staying. That's it. Thank you. Michael Kerrigan, followed by Lonnie Douglas. It's a hard Michael to follow. Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is uh, Michael Kerrigan. I'm a proud resident of Ward, Ward 7. I work for Community Alliance of uh, Lane County. We had a sweet, gentle, homeless gentleman come by Calc looking for a safe place to sleep. His basic human right. I talked to the guy, told him the rest stops have waiting lists. They are full. For whatever reason, the mission said he couldn't stay there. I had no place to send him. I said, okay, stay in the Calc porch tonight. I will try again tomorrow. But I don't have a lot of faith that I can find him a, a place tomorrow. And thank you for addressing the uh, rest stop uh, I issue today. Uh, it, I think it was great, but we need to do more and we need to, to move faster. We need to find a site for all the, re the residents of Nightingale so they can stay as one group. More, more car, car camping we talked about today a rest stop in every ward, of course, and a homeless shelter. Because the gentleman who was on the Calc porch, there's many more of them in, uh, in our community needing a safe place to sleep. With all the Nazi and hate activity happening in the Whitaker neighborhood where I, where I work and, and, and where I live, we just got to speak out against that, which we did big time in our rally we had in uh, Whitaker on Sunday. But we, it's also happening in other parts of Eugene as well. So we need to send a strong counter message. And one way to do that is making Eugene as strong a sanctuary city as we can, a city where everybody is treated with the dignity and respect, including the gentleman who was on the Calc porch today. Thank you. Thank you. Lonnie Douglas, followed by Sarah Hubby. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm just here tonight to uh, support uh, Health Care for All Oregon and their request uh, that y'all for the resolution on uh, single payer. Um, in the military, I had basically single payer with Tricare, and I've seen single payer in different countries. And I'll tell you what, it's uh, it's really nice. Um, and the fact that we have people in America that don't have health care is a travesty. Um, I also would like to say uh, about the homeless issue, uh, before I went in the military, I worked um, with the homeless up in Anchorage, Alaska. And that city, I thought it was normal for a city to have a shelter, to have a place where people could eat. To We had a community service patrol, which is what I worked on, that patrolled like Cahoots does 24-7 and picked people up. Um, and the fact that Eugene doesn't have that, uh, frankly shocked me and the lack of funds to go toward the homeless issue also shocks me. The, the truth of the matter is we're not going to get rid of the homeless by ignoring them or by trying to hide them or push them out. They're here and yeah, they affect business and stuff downtown, but the way that you deal with that is by giving them a place outside of downtown that's safe, that they can go, that they can eat, um, wash their clothes and sleep. Um, so I would encourage you to, to look at that, to actually stepping up and having Eugene actually deal with the homeless issue on a, in a real way, not just passing ordinances against dogs or smoking, but actually deal with it because they're our neighbors, they're our family, they're our friends, and many of us are just a paycheck away from being homeless. So thank you, and uh, y'all have a nice evening. Thank you. Sarah Hubby, followed by Sally Elmstead. Good evening. My name is Sarah Hubie. Hubie, thank yeah. you. And um, I'm a school teacher here at uh, 4J District. Um, I'm here to speak in favor of the sanctuary ordinance. 
I've had the privilege to meet and come to know many people who have come here from Mexico and Central and South America, hoping to escape desperate situations and or to find work that will enable them to support themselves and their families. One young man came here because his wife was unable to nurse and they could not afford to buy milk for their baby. And though he took any work that was available down in Mexico, they were still unable to feed their baby. Um, so he made the extremely difficult choice to leave his wife and baby and make a very dangerous trip to come here so that she wouldn't die. Um, and once he made it here, he was one of the most valued employees, full-time employees at a local business which specializes in manual labor. And he was able to provide from a distance for his little baby. One of my students uh, at school wanted to send the following message to you through me. Uh, she, wrote, she wrote it today. She arrived from Nicaragua in October to live with her father, coming also from a very desperate situation there in Nicaragua. And this is a translation of her message. Hi, all of you. I want to say, please don't destroy our dreams. Please. I am a simple dreamer girl who came to the United States to fulfill my dreams and to have a better life, of course, with your help. Please only give us the opportunity to continue in this country. Please, I only ask this and hope you understand. Please, you are my hope. Many of these people are some of the kindest, most hardworking, industrious, helpful, family and community oriented, funny and friendly people I have ever known. Please vote to provide the strongest protection possible for these members of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Sally Elmstead, followed by Sir On Fulton. My name is Sally Einstad. I live between 30th and 32nd Avenue in Ms. Taylor's ward on University Street. And I'm here to raise concerns about the Amazon Corner development that was mentioned earlier. I found out about it in from the Neighborhood Association, and it sounds as if everything's all a done deal. I've lived in my home for 45 years, so I know that neighborhood very, very well. And recently, we had a red stutter signal put in at 30th Avenue and University Street to help the children and others in the neighborhood get across 30th Avenue more safely, and that's been a wonderful thing. But it has increased traffic down University Street quite a great deal. And as I look at a high-rent apartment complex going in at 32nd and Hilliard Street, and look at the traffic patterns there, I realize that with 1.5 cars roughly, per, or parking spaces roughly, per apartment, and the fact that those are high rent apartments where there's likely to be a lot of roommate situations with multiple vehicles, and a ground floor with retail and perhaps restaurants, there's not enough parking there. And there's only a seven foot buffer, as I understand it, from the back of the property east of the apartment complex, dividing it from the homes that are just like mine on Alder Street. And that 62 foot tall building is going to shade from midday until sunset and I have concerns about that. Thank you. Sharon Fulton, followed by Emily Fox. Thank you, all of us citizens in Eugene. I am here um, concerning the Amazon corner. I have been a resident on Ferry Street for more than 25 years. And it is my concern with this new high-rise apartment complex, not only of it being so tall and it will be um, really out of proportion for our residential area, but I'm also concerned for the traffic. Hilliard is one of the busiest streets in Eugene that I have been informed of through the South Eugene Association. 
I'm also concerned that they're going to be putting a crosswalk across 33rd, I mean 32nd, and if they did the traffic analysis, they're going to notice that people will not use that. They have a tendency to go from 31st across to Albertsons because it's quicker and um, it, it just seems to be easier. I'm also concerned with the traffic because of where I'm located on Ferry Street. I have noticed that the traffic has gone exponentially and the road in front of my house is rotting away. I've got big potholes in front of there now because of all the traffic that was being done on Hilliard and Willamette when they were doing that construction and they used in front of my house as a cutaway. My road in front of my house has not been touched since 64. So now I've got these big potholes coming out. The amount of traffic is going to be pulling out onto Hilliard is going to um, create a big traffic jam. The other concern that I have is um, the amount of traffic that's going to be in all the other residential areas. When I was informed of the traffic analysis, they only did it on peak hour at six o'clock or at five o'clock instead of watching for morning traffic and afternoon traffic lunch traffic gets really heavy as well as the mornings thank, thank you. you very much thank you emily fox followed by um lena van brunt i'm emily fox and i live in betty taylor's ward on 31st street i'm also concerned about growth and livability as it comes into contact with amazon corner um, i thought i will age in place in my home i recently did remodel i put a new foundation in i have trouble now crossing hilliard to get over to albertson's i thought oh when i'm older i won't need a car i won't be able to use a car i'll just go to albertson's it's going to be difficult now i think the city has a problem People quote Envision Eugene. One pillar is promote compact development. The, another pillar is repair, enhance, protect neighborhoods. They're kind of in opposition. Eugene Lancone says uh, 900201F, increase density of a new development while maintaining character and livability of the neighborhood. When I talked to the uh, city planner at our neighborhood meeting, I said, well, what about the livability of the neighborhood and she said yes there's this is where things fall through the cracks I said what can I do she said talk to the City Council I'm talking to you there is something you can do you could I think it's important to let people who live near a proposed development have a say have bigger say than people who live across the city or who live in in Cottage Grove as sometimes happens and I think that if you said there's a limit, like maybe on C2 land that's right in a residential area, we're going to limit it to three stories. I know I'm not no growth, but five stories is just too much. If there were some new ruling that, th that three stories would be the limit, there's nothing taller than three stories after 18th Street except Cascade Manor, which was done years ago and is kind of way tucked in the hill. I think that would be really helpful because the rest of Eugene is going to be facing this. As the paper article said, we're just the beginning. Thank you. Lena Van Brunt, followed by Charmaine Burr, Be I don't know, Bebby, Be Berg, something, Charmaine. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lina Van Brunt, and I'm from Ward 7, live in the Whitaker, and I live with lots of immigrants and people of color in my neighborhood. And I'm here to urge you to make Eugene a sanctuary city, and I don't need to take any more time, so. That's Thank it. you very much. Charmaine, and I'm sorry, I'm butchering your name. You can explain it to me. Um, I'm Charmaine Reg. Oh. It's Hungarian. Thank you. Um, I'm in uh, my Clark's district, and I totally support the ban and uh, of dogs and cigarettes. Uh, it's a mess down there. Uh, there's cigarette butts all over the sidewalks, people lying all over the street. Uh, they talk about rest stops. That's all they do is rest. And if they're travelers, then why don't they boogie down the road? I'm getting sick of looking at them. 
I go up, I ride my bike, and it's a disgrace along the river. I, I drew a couple weeks ago what I saw, tent after tent, trash pile after trash pile. They want respect, well, they totally disrespect the environment, disrespect the river, disrespect the citizens who foot the bill for everything. They don't contribute anything. I went to the library a week and a half ago. I go up to get a magazine out. The stench of urine was overwhelming. I went down, three guys sitting there, as they always do. They just line up in all the upholstered chairs. Well, they can have them because they brought the bed bugs last year. And it, guy, backpack, guy, backpack. I went down, I talked to them. They were going to go up there. It was disgusting, the smell of urine on both sides of the magazine racks. And they showed me a list of people who were being banned because of these types of behaviors. Uh, twice when I was there, guards were called to the bathroom because uh, men were naked in the bathrooms. I'm just, I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the downtown, how it looks. I'm sick of the river, how it looks. I hate litter. And I'm sick of the library. It's like a default homeless camp. There's one word you people don't say. There's lazy people, too, and you never bring Thank that you. up. Thank you. Thank you. Stacy Goldenberg, followed by followed by Carol Goldenberg. Hi, I'm Stacy Goldenberg from Ward Two. Um, I'm here to support Sanctuary City and to, or Eugene as a Sanctuary City, and to urge the City Council to take the matter very seriously and to expedite the consideration of the ordinance. And um, I think that. I'm really surprised that I'm, that I'm even here having to talk about this. If you would have asked me a year or two ago, I would have been shocked. I'm a, I have a, a degree in history, and to think that this is happening in our country is pretty scary right now for me and a lot of my friends and family. Um, so I, and I would just really just echo all the statements I've heard tonight in support of Eugene becoming a sanctuary city. Um, and I also support and echo the sentiments I've heard about um, expanding um, appropriate housing for homeless people. Um, I can't imagine that we can't raise some taxes and, and raise some donations, and I'm sure that there's a lot of support for providing appropriate, basic, you know, humanitarian housing for people who are... We don't like to look at, I know some people don't like to look at the people on the streets, and there, there are some very dysfunctional people who are homeless, it's true, um, but they aren't going away. And, and it just, it's hard to imagine that people just don't understand that it's the right thing to do to help the people who are unable to, or un, really unable to help themselves and have some serious problems. And probably a lot of these people will always be homeless or will always have problems. And so um, we can't just hide them and arrest them and, and make their lives miserable by, by tagging them as criminals. So thank you. Thank you. Carol Tony Goldenberg, followed by Kathy Kathy Felty or something. Hi, I'm Hi. Carol Tony Goldenberg, and I live out uh, on Crow Road in West Eugene, and I'm really for the sanctuary city too. Um, I know some people from Mexico, and I see them bring in different people every once in a while. And um, I see them work. They're just good people. They really work hard. And um, every, I've been to, I came from California where, you know, we always had uh, people from Mexico working for us, and they were really good people. I, there was very seldom any problem. Um, I don't know what being a sanctuary city might be, and I think a lot of people don't understand that. It's kind of a scary term to some people, and I've been thinking about it, so uh, I'm going to find out more about what that means to you. 
the other thing I wanted to bring up is I've heard threats that if you do Sanctuary City, then the federal government will take away your funds. And I know that the big uh, project of the EMX uh, bus line out there <coughs> has been funded by federal funds. And I know a lot of people love to think about maybe taking a bus when they can't take cars and everything, and it will serve some people. Uh, I hope this is not an issue with all of you uh, because of the funding thing. Oh, we can't be a, a sanctuary city because of the money we'll lose from them. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Kathy, um, I don't know, Fel Felty? Feely. Feely. Sorry, I apologize if I'm messing up your name. Feely, thank you. Hi, I am in Ward 7 in Claire's uh, Ward uh, in Whitaker. Uh, first, I'd like to ask the City Council to pass a resolution condemning gutting of the Endangered Species Act that Congress is considering. Uh, I would also like to ask that the pot buffer uh, be put in place as soon as possible. We don't need to have end-to-end -end pot shops in Whitaker. Uh, we already have microbreweries and distilleries. We don't need a third element. Um, in terms of the homeless camps, a typical day in Whitaker is that the mission can serve up to a thousand people, I think now with their new kitchen, uh, to feed them, but they can only house about 400 people. And so you've got four to 600 people that camp in the Whitaker. And if it's not nailed down, it's gone. We have people at our doors, uh, in our yards, stealing, screaming, going to the bathroom, doing drugs. A typical um, uh, opening of business in Whitaker is to clean up human excrement and to clean up the needles. So w residents and businesses are severely impacted by this. Um, it's not okay to warehouse uh, mentally ill and uh, substance abuse people in the parks. You know, it's it's not home housing them, um, and it is a problem. And I know the city doesn't fund mental health; the, the county does. But the truth is, you're spending money on mental health issues every time you have to deal with somebody that's running around screaming in traffic or unable to take care of themselves. Um, we need to destabilize. Uh, well, Whitaker is being destabilized. We have a high rental rate. People are selling their houses. Absentee landlords are owning the homes. I'd like you to put some money to partner with NEDCO to help first-time home buyers move Thank back you. in. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I'm falling behind here. Next is Gadsby, followed by Sarah Pichonary. Gadsby. Yes, okay. Hello, thank you for your time. My name is Chris Gadsby. <clears throat> I live in the Whitaker. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things out loud. We had a murder in the Whitaker. Y'all cleared the park box. Good job, good job. Murder, murder is still unsolved. We have a houseless issue. We have open air drug markets. We have people that have been living in our parks for a while. You decided that we're going to ban smoking and dogs. Where are these people going to go? Your ward? Yours? They're going to come to the Whitaker because we're tolerant. But we are done. We're saturated. We've had enough. We have no place else to put these people. They're in the parks. The parks. They're sleeping in our parks. And that's okay. That's cool with everybody. People are sleeping in the parks. You're going to exclude them from downtown because of their dogs, compassion animals, whichever, or because they smoke, because they have this one vice that's legal. They're coming to live with us. I don't think that's okay. I also just had a really good idea. Those high income dwellings that are going to go into the South Hills, let's put a homeless shelter there. Let's make it a single level homeless shelter. It won't obscure anyone's view. 
the sun will still be able to shine on your gardens and you will have more houses for people to not sleep in our parks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Pichonary, followed by Dr. Henry Elder. Hey, everybody. I'm Sarah Pichonary. I'm part of Claire Sierra's ward. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Pryor and Councillor Clark for expressing an interest in applying capital investment towards a public shelter. Um, I appreciate that. However, uh, I'm also deeply concerned with pairing that with an increase in law enforcement. Um, I think that we have increased law enforcement. Let's try something else, maybe. Um, I'm also kind of fearful that if the city's going to apply capital investment towards a public shelter and increase law enforcement, does that mean then that the law enforcement is going to require homeless people to be at that shelter? Because it's what it sounds like to me. I could be wrong. I'd love to talk more about this idea. Um, but that's my biggest fear. Um, also, uh, just to talk about the library and things like that, um, if you're tired of smelling the stench of people, where are their showers? If you're tired of smelling their urine, recognize that they are possibly incontinent and don't have the services that they need to clean themselves. Um, how about laundry facilities? Uh, shelter outside of the library. I just feel like the city is really curtailing this issue and it's affecting everyone of any class or income scale. Uh, the issue needs to be dealt with. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Dr. Henry Elder, and you're the last one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Hank Elder. I'm, um, <clears throat> I am uh, I came to Eugene uh, about a year, a, a couple of years ago to work at the homelessness manufacturing facility down on 5th Street and, um, and work with uh, the mentally ill in the jail. And, um, and so I, there's a, there was a combination, there's a connection between the health care for all Oregon uh, resolution that I came here to uh, support and the the work. Uh, excuse me, I, I'm in Betty uh, Betty Taylor's ward to um, <clears throat> then then and uh, there's the connection is is this that that uh, that many of the mentally ill people uh, who uh, are uh, unable to cooperate with with policemen uh, end up in the jail and um, talk about a place that stinks uh, in the back rooms in the in the uh, segregation units where many of these mentally ill people go that stinks uh, it stinks morally and it stinks um, literally uh, but I want to talk here about uh, about what we can do to make this all better, and uh, and I believe that the the ACA has made that considerably made the care of mentally ill people much better. Uh, but uh, there is much further to go. I'm excited about it. I think um, if we can resist the the, the federal government's uh, oppression of of our uh, are moving forward with better health care, cheaper health care. Oregon and California and Washington can make it happen in our states. Um, and we've made good, great progress with this, the coordinated care organizations to, to uh, move that forward. And we must do things like this resolution to move it further forward. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, that was a wonderful outpouring, a distressing outpouring in some ways. And I'm taking a list of counselors who may want to make comments. So I have Mike, Alan, Claire, George, anybody else? Betty, anybody else? Okay. Mike, you've got it. Thank you, Mayor. Counselor. Sorry. I just uh, had a really quick point. Um, there's something Dennis said that, that struck with me. Um, I think we should talk about this a little more when we're talking about Envision Eugene, where we talk about compact urban development. I, as near as I understand it, we're talking about all of the city, unless there's a place where we're not talking about compact urban development. 
<clears throat> is it, I, I'd love to know the places that we're not going to want to do compact development because it's suburban. I thought that was an interesting little use of the words there because as near as I understand, it, we're talking about everywhere in Eugene. So I'd be interested in that distinction if it's made. Thank you. Councilor Zelenka. Yeah, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I, I talked to Charlie earlier and I offered to help uh, craft a resolution for council consideration, so I'll be working with Charlie and other folks on that. Um, one comment about the um, downtown issues. To me, the issues of the behaviors downtown that make people scared to go there, scared to be there, void it altogether, are not the same issues as homelessness. They're very different to me. The uh, downtown has gotten really bad, and we need to clean it up. At the same time, we can work on and provide more shelters for the unhoused and work on the homelessness issues. They're not mutually exclusive, and I don't even think they're necessarily related. I don't think the homeless people downtown are causing the problems that are creating the, 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 the bad behaviors downtown. I think they're a different set of people. So uh, that's how I'll be looking at this as we move forward. Thank you, Councilor Syret. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who came to speak, including those who had to get back home. Um, so I just have a number of comments in no particular order. I do want to go on record as supporting a public shelter. I do think that's a very important goal that we have in mind, even as we work on expanding our more temporary shelters, which is right now really our rest stop program. And progress on finding new sites for our rest stop program has been frustratingly slow. Um, and really what I've seen is the biggest barrier to expanding that temporary shelter program is opposition by local residents. So, uh, and I fear that a public shelter would face similar opposition in terms of where it's cited. So we need help to educate folks on what the rest stop program does, what a public shelter would do, how once you give a folks housing, they're no longer homeless. Um, and we've got a heavy lift before us to get that done. So I'm, I'm hoping folks who had the motivation to come and speak to us tonight will be part of helping with that. Um, I'll also point out, uh, and this is the only thing I'll say about the Amazon development, apartment dwellers are <laughs> residents too. I'm not sure why an apartment building in a residential neighborhood is so problematic. I understand some of the structural issues and the traffic, but I just want to voice that. Um, I'm very grateful to those who turned out for the anti-hate rally in Whitaker on Sunday. I was unable to be there myself. Um, I'm very pleased to hear that folks came out in opposition to the hate graffiti that happened in our neighborhood and apparently in other places. Um, I, um, I am very eager to have our discussion on a sanctuary city and to support that proposal. I personally think the threats to pull federal funding are hollow. Um, the MX funding, I believe, is secure, and there would be a great lawsuit if uh, someone tried to pull that from us if we passed a sanctuary city ordinance. And lastly, um, I did raise uh, the displacement issue when we spoke about downtown and various strategies that we might use to deal with some of the challenges downtown and the fact that some folks would end up moving into the Whitaker neighborhood and into the University District neighborhood. Um, it is on the radar of our chief of police. I, I can't say that we have a solution to that, but I appreciate hearing from residents about their concerns regarding that because it's very important that we keep that in mind as we figure out how we're going to deal with some of the challenges before us. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Poling. Thank you. Uh, real quick. I would urge the city manager and the mayor to put the uh, public hearing now that the work session poll has been approved. I, I would urge the mayor and the city manager to put the work session uh, on that on our agenda as soon as possible so we could uh, get on, get on one thousand foot buffer. Oh, gotcha. I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. That and the other thing is the, uh, the references made tonight reference smoking downtown and dogs. We have yet to even have a public hearing on that. No decision has been made, so we welcome your input. <coughs> and the final thing is I challenge anybody, I mean absolutely anybody, to find in any of our meetings where one of our counselors referred to a homeless person as garbage. That absolutely makes me angry when people come up and make comments like that about statements that we supposedly made about an individual. 
and then somebody made a comment about me personally um, referencing, making some negative reference to homeless people. Even after they attacked my house and, and we think one of them stomped and kicked my dog, I never, never made any comment and disparaging remark about the, the people that were there advocating for the homeless people despite all the filthy, nasty things they said to me the weeks following and all the, the city council meetings after that incident five years ago. Now, I will admit the other day when we were talking about the issues in the downtown area, which I think um, Alan, Councilor Zelenka, pretty well summed it up. There's two different issues going on. There's the homeless issue, and then there's the antisocial, negative, and criminal behaviors going on downtown. Now, I referenced that. I started out by saying exactly that, that there are two different topics here, homelessness and what's going on downtown. And I referred to those people that are victimizing our citizens as miscreants. And if you, can, if you take that comment and think I made that toward a homeless person, you better clean your ears out and listen to what we say up here, because I'm tired of people coming up here putting words into my mouth. I did not make a reference to a homeless person as being, as being a, a miscreant. It's the people downtown taking part in the negative behaviors. Thank you, Betty. Uh, Councilor Taylor. Thank you. I just want to comment on two things, I think. Um, Someone said we should address the behavior instead of looking at dogs and smoking, and I think that's a good statement that we shouldn't try to exclude a whole class of people. Um, and I want to make it clear that the city council cannot do anything about regulating the size of the development at 32nd and Hilliard. I understand people's concerns, but that is not something we can do. And a staff person, if, if you were told to go to the city council, that just doesn't do any good. We can't do anything about it. We can express an opinion, but we can't do anything. Thank you. Councilor Evans. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, again, I want to echo the sentiments of my uh, fellow councilors and thank everyone for coming out tonight and speaking. Um, couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, yes, I think we do need to have a public shelter in Eugene. Um, I think there's no question that we need to, to have a public shelter. However, we need to be able to pay for it and sustain it and operate it and maintain it. And you know, we may be able to put together the resources to build a facility or retrofit an existing building into a facility, but we would be in the same boat as the state is right now with the proposal to close a brand new um, uh, mental hospital out there on Highway 99 between Eugene and Junction City, where they don't have the money to operate it. And we need to be able to put more resources into human services. And that comes from the state level through the county. And if we're going to have any kind of constructive way of dealing with the human service needs that we have in this state as well as locally, that we need to put forth bills in the legislature, our legislators need to do this, that will help to direct funds to go directly into um, alleviating homelessness and <laughs> other situations that um, people are finding themselves in distress. We don't have the resources and the city is not constituted to be able to solve these problems. What we can do is we can advocate for solutions. And I think that all of us up here have been trying to advocate for solutions. Um, as far as, you know, the uh, public safety issues downtown, those issues are all across our community. So when I put out a work session poll about public safety, it was not just for downtown, it was for Whitaker, it's for um, Westside Jefferson, it's for Bethel, 
because we find this kind of behavior going on all throughout the city. There's a large concentration of that behavior downtown. It's readily apparent. But there, I, I echo what Councilor Zelenka said. There's a difference between <coughs> bad behavior, criminal behavior, and associating that with people who are houseless. There's a lot of people out there who have houses that are engaged in this kind of behavior. So I think I'm out of time. You are. Yeah. <laughs> Councilor Pryor. Uh, I also appreciate all the people that came and spoke tonight. Um, and, uh, and those folks that came uh, asking for the city's uh, position on Sanctuary City, um, most of the other communities that have passed Sanctuary City's resolutions have done it through a resolution medium. We could have done that a month ago. Um, but the advocates for Sanctuary City here uh, really wanted us to take the next step, which was to go all the way to an ordinance. And an ordinance, because of its very nature, uh, requires public hearings, it requires a drafting process, it's more lengthy and may provide additional protections, but we chose consciously uh, to go through a process to draft an actual ordinance that could then go to a public hearing and then be passed. So that's why it's taken so long. It's not some sort of stonewalling or reluctance. Uh, it's the level of, um, I guess you would say, security that an ordinance would represent as opposed to just a resolution. Um, also with regard to the discussion about uh, the balance of compassion for the condition and enforcement for the behavior, uh, I'm gratified that we're even having the conversation in those terms because not that long ago, we just lumped everybody together and tried to come up with a one size fits all solution, which one size doesn't fit all and will not be a solution. So the fact that we're beginning to understand what we're talking about more um, comprehensively and completely allows us to begin to craft not giant unworkable solutions, but very specific and very workable solutions for the different populations. And so I'm an advocate for public shelter for the people whose condition uh, necessitates a public shelter, and I think we should figure out a way, um, recognizing what Councillor Evans just said, it's easy enough to build one, but we have to figure out how to operate it, and I'm all in to figure out how we can not only build a public shelter, but how we can operate it. At the same time, we cannot ignore the behavior that has gotten out of control. And, and as others have pointed out, uh, particularly in the downtown area, uh, this behavior must be controlled, must be managed. It has to be brought into line. Um, and if that requires more enforcement, I think that may be the structure to use it. Now, if that enforcement were to somehow spill over and say, oh, well, you have to go to the shelter, that would be an, imp an imposition on the condition. So no. Uh, th that would not happen. Um, they are separate responses to different issues, but they don't necessarily manage each other. I think the compassion and the enforcement are compatible, but one doesn't drive the other. Um, I have been downtown. I've seen aggressive behavior. I've seen aggressive dogs. I, and I, I think there is a safety issue here. Um, other dogs have been attacked. People have been uh, harassed. I think dogs is a serious issue. I don't know where I will land on smoking, but I do, th I do see dogs as an issue that we do need to talk about. And we will have a public hearing, which allows you to talk about it as well. And I think that's as things should be. So I'm gratified the conversation has evolved as well as it has. And I hope the conversation will continue to evolve in these ways. Thank you. Councillor Semple. Thank you so much to everyone who takes the time and comes out to tell us what they're thinking and your ideas. A lot of S words tonight that I am in favor of. Shelter, single payer health care, sanctuary city, safe downtown. <laughs> I'm not in favor of the bans. And that's where I stand right now. So let's work. Thank you all very much again for coming, for your thoughts, for your passion on these issues. We're working on them, and we, uh, we do seek your input and your, your uh, reactions to our work. So thank you for taking the time. And that ends the public forum. Yes? Okay. Next up. We have, oh, I have to, I have to open it. No, open yes. It? No. City manager starts it. Oh, city manager starts it. Yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay. So, next we have a public hearing. The public's confused. On the, Excuse me. Could you please keep could, it down? We still have a meeting going on. Okay. So, congratulations for finishing. 
<laughs> we're, we're, not we're still at work. <laughs> Okay, City Manager, uh, next up, uh, marijuana. Uh, yes, ma'am. We have a public hearing on the marijuana tax appeal. And in November, Eugene voters approved a 3% tax on marijuana sales. The ordinance containing that 3% tax included an appeals process if a business disagreed with the decision of the city related to the amount of the tax. The Oregon Department of Revenue is willing to collect city and county imposed taxes, but only if the local government agrees to allow the state to use its appeals process. This public hearing is on an ordinance that would allow the city manager to sign an intergovernmental agreement with the state, allowing the state to use its appeals process. Well, now I can open the public hearing. Got it. Public hearing is now open. Do we, have anybody? Do we have anyone to comment on this issue at all? Beth? No. No, no, signed no one's public. signed up. So I guess we can close the public hearing. And that lightning. That's it. Okay. Cool. That was easy. Uh, the next piece is remember the... Remember that one. Yeah, remember. <laughs> right. Right. That was great. The next is a manager disposition process for downtown. Uh, yes, and uh, Nan, do you have a presentation that you'd like to make? Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Tonight we're asking for action on releasing requests for proposals, two of them, for the sale of two city-owned properties, one at Athan Mill and one at Broadway and Hilliard. Both of these properties are located on key downtown corridors and actually at entry points to downtown. Um, we've reached out to the neighbors, to the property owners immediately adjacent um, for both of these parcels. Uh, and if you go, if you choose to go forward with these RFPs, then we will bring, we will bring you back the responses. It's our intent to do this in a very timely fashion, and in fact, to be able to release the RFPs by the end of this month, perhaps out for 45 days, so that we'd have responses back mid-April for your consideration. Thank you. Questions? No questions? No comments? We need a motion to... Right. Yes, go for it. We move to approve the proposed RFP process for disposition of the two sites using objectives that are consistent with attachment B in our packet. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor of the motion? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in favor, none opposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are finished.